But as you take your seat, grab your Bible, open it to the Gospel of Luke. Now, Dr. Luke is writing the story of Jesus to a very wealthy, influential man named Theophilus. Other than that, we have no clue who he was, but he was obviously a very prominent individual. And Luke is telling us that his purpose is so that Theophilus might know the certainty of those things wherein he has been instructed. And as he begins to tell the story of Jesus, he does so in a way that, kind of like Elisha, it's just absolutely in the face of tradition and culture. Because he begins to tell the story of the most important figure in human history, Jesus Christ, by telling the story of two women. Women did not count at this time and in this culture. You, you normally did not mention them in a setting like this. And Luke says, no, I'm, I'm starting the story talking about women. And not only that, he chooses two categories of women that represented the very lowest spots on the food chain at this time. A single girl who is pregnant and an elderly woman who has been barren all of her life and never able to have kids. There, there was no way to get lower than that. And Luke starts the story of Jesus Christ by telling the story of these two women. And he tells the story of how each of them had a miraculous birth, one who gave birth in her old age and the other who gave birth while still a virgin by means of the Spirit of God overpowering her and working in her something that has never happened before or since, a virgin birth. And of course, those two sons were the ones that we know as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, as the word is more literally, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's an amazing story. And uh, one central focus today, now, don't forget this, you can trust God. That's what we're going to focus on. That seemed basic. It, it is basic, but it's so basic that I think a lot of times we don't understand how important it is. You can trust God to keep his promises. God made us to be dependent, not self-sufficient. In our culture today, we are raised from the time that we're tiny kids to be self-sufficient. We're taught that's good, that's, that's profitable. And yet the Word of God says God made us to be dependent upon him and his promises. Now here's the problem with that. Once we lose the ability to trust, we also lose the capacity to have healthy relationships. Look around you in the world today. Do you see a lot of healthy relationships? <laughs> Not a lot, even in churches. And I am firmly convinced that one of the reasons for that is because we have forgotten how to trust. Trust is a big deal. And it begins by learning how to trust God. When you cannot trust God, you cannot trust anyone else. And sometimes I hear people say very proudly, well, I just don't trust anybody. Like, look at me, I'm strong. And can I say to you, hopefully in a gentle and non-judgmental way, when I hear somebody make that statement or a statement like that, I'll tell you the thought that goes through my mind. This person is sick. This is a very needy person who obviously has a great deal of pain and hurt in his or her life because they've never learned how to trust. And so if, if you fall into that category, again, I'm not judging you, I'm just telling you that up front so you know where I'm going, you need to hear what I have to say. This is important, this is huge. Now. In this passage, beginning in verse 57, remember that Dr. Luke, much of this gospel is written in poetic form. He is piecing together sources that he has collected. He has spent a long time amassing all of the songs and literature and tradition uh, that has been written about Jesus in the 30 or so years since he has ascended into heaven. But there are still many eyewitnesses that he says he has interviewed, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. So he is putting this together from those sources, and much of it is in poetic form because at this time, people did not read as much as we do today. Most people uh, in 
in regular society read very little. Uh, most women were illiterate. Uh, people didn't consider it worthwhile to teach them how to read or write. What are they going to read anyway? Most information in oral societies like this, and there are many today, information is retained by passing it on orally in song and poem and spoken word from generation to generation. So this is, this is all in poetic form, and it begins with three verses, three parallel units, and each one has three parts. Elizabeth takes the center stage in one of them. Zacharias, her husband, takes the center stage in the third one. And in each case, after they appear in one verse, then friends and neighbors respond in the next verse, and then in the next verse we have the point, the message. So let's pick it up, unit 1, verse 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. Elizabeth is well past the age of childbearing. This is a miracle. But just like God promised, she brought forth a son. In verse 58, we have the reaction of friends and neighbors, her, her neighbors and her cousins, and that's a way to say her family members, not necessarily all of them literally cousins, but all the members of her extended family heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. Why are they so much into this rejoicing? Well, everybody rejoices at the birth of a child, but you see, this is special because, as I said a moment ago, this lady has lived under a stigma all of her life life. And all of her life, she has heard people gossiping and, and spreading rumors about her. There's got to be some secret sin in her life for which she has never been able to bear children, and they can't figure out why Zacharias has not just divorced her and thrown her on the trash heap of life, so to speak. They, they don't get that. This is not what is normal in that culture. And so now her stigma has been removed, and we read in verse 59, it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. This is the point. This is really the centerpiece of this little stanza. They bring this baby to be circumcised as the Scripture commands, beginning in Genesis chapter 17. God said, this will be the sign of the covenant or the promise that I am making with you and your people forever, Abraham, on the eighth day of life of a young boy, you will bring that boy to be circumcised. Now, if you're not a student of the Bible, you're probably thinking like I was thinking the first time I read this in the Bible, what a weird sign. It just did not make any sense to me until I understood that by removing the covering of the male reproductive organ, God was reminding them there is something wrong with the male seed, the first birth. We need a second birth where the seed of life is revealed. We could go on and on. That's a very beautiful symbolism. We don't have time to deal with it this morning. But the point that I'm making is simply this. Israel understood, and they understood that circumcision was the sign of the promise that God had made to them to bless them and to be a blessing for all the families of the earth. So this is huge. It is another constant reminder. You can trust God. You can believe God to keep what he has promised forever. That's the point. Now, since Zacharias is silent, you remember what happened when the angel in the temple that day announced to him that he was going to have a son, Zacharias didn't believe it. And the angel says, all right, here's your sign. <laughs> You're not going to be able to speak until this baby is born. So the family and friends have gathered together as you would expect them to do. And this is so important in this culture in the first century. And they're all gathered around. Zacharias can't speak. It's normally the father's responsibility to name the child. And since he can't speak, they speak for him. Well, of course, we know what Zacharias wants. He's going to want to name this baby Zach Jr. That's just the way it is. And there's a lot of cultures where that's true. We have people named after fathers all the time. We have a lot of Latin Americans in our church. That's very prominent in Latin American culture. To name the first son after the father is a very, very common thing. And it was just the expected thing here. And so everybody is saying, oh, this is great. We're celebrating the circumcision of this little baby. And uh, now today we're going to announce his name. He can't speak. So we're all going to call him Zacharias because that's the family name and all of this type of stuff. Now, before we go on, 
on, let me just give you something to think about. The foundation of our trust is critical. Because if we are trusting in the faithfulness of other people to be consistently faithful all the time, we're going to be disappointed, right? You ever been disappointed by somebody? <laughs> of course you have. Have you ever disappointed somebody? Of course you have, if you're honest. I have, you have, we all do. That's the way life works. But if we're trusting only in people, we're going to be miserable and we're going to come to that conclusion. I just don't trust anybody. But if we learn to make the foundation of our trust God and realize that God always keeps his promises and that we can trust God to work through other people even when they are wrong, suddenly we have a new worldview. We have a new perspective because the focus of our trust is God himself and his promises. This is the purpose of God's constant reminders to his people, such as circumcision. Now, unit two, verse 60. And his mother answered and said, not so, but he shall be called John. John literally means Yahweh or Jehovah, as we sometimes say, is gracious. Now, this is very forward of Elizabeth to say this because it was not the woman's place to name the child. And that's true in cultures today. We have so many cultures represented in our church, and because of that, we, we get uh, the, the blessing of being exposed to a lot of that. A few years ago, we had a Nigerian baby dedication right here. And in Nigeria, that's, that's still a culture today. The father names, gives a Christian name to the child. And it's not on the day of birth, but when the child is then brought to the congregation and nobody knows what that name is except the father. And, and then that morning as we did this, then he passes the name to me. I take the baby, hold the baby, and announce to family and friends for the first time the name of the child. It's very cool. So there are cultures in the world that operate like that even today, and that certainly was this culture. For, so for, for Liz to, to step up and say, no, 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 his name shall be John. Liz, what got into you? What, what do you mean? And, and they're astounded. Look in verse 61. This is their reaction. They said to her, there's none of your kindred that's called by that name. John? Where did that come from? I, why would you do that? Nobody used baby name books. Nobody got names from soap operas or movies in those days. And, and they're like, where did this come from? If you don't want to name him Zacharias, then name him after his uncle or his grandfather or, or nobody in your family's named John. What, what possibly possessed you to say that his name would be John? And then in verse 63, here's the point of it all. He, Zacharias, uh, verse 62, they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he, he asked for a writing table and wrote saying, and this is so great, he writes on this wax table, his name is John. Now that is a statement of faith. He didn't say, let's call him John, or his name will be John, or I think that, no, his name is John. Now here's why that's so important. Zacharias has not been able to talk for nine months because he didn't believe God. He's had nine months to meditate. He's been able to reflect quietly for nine months, and he's decided he's going to trust God. God said, you're going to name this kid John. He says, I, his name is John. <laughs> I don't have anything to do with it. His name is John. That's what God said. Now, our trust, as I've been saying, is grounded in an understanding of what God has said. Now, this is critical. In today's world in America, our students growing up today, and even those who are no longer students, those who are young adults and young couples, have been raised, regardless of their ethnic background, have been raised in this country to have faith in faith. I want you to think about what I just said. We have today faith and faith. Well, I just, we just need to be people of faith. Well, what are you going to believe in? Well, what, whatever, you know, you have, just, just have faith because the important thing is to have faith. Well, in what? Well, just to have faith. Faith and faith. 
If I just believe hard enough, if I can generate enough faith, then maybe something good's going to happen. Well, that is the polar opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach faith in faith. The Bible teaches faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith is simply, in other words, believing what God has said. It's objective. It's not subjective. It's clear. It's not mysterious. It is genuine. It is authentic. It is not imagined. It is not faith in faith. It is faith in what God has spoken. So uh, if we never learn what God has promised, your ability to trust is always going to be limited. When will you be diligent in learning what God has said? Now, remember this also. It's not just that because Zacharias was a priest for crying out loud. He had a pretty fair understanding of Scripture. But yet he had more faith in his faith, his liturgy, his rituals, his tradition. And when push came to shove and God sent him a direct message, he didn't believe it. That's a tragedy. Do you have faith in faith, or do you really believe what God said? Well, this is what I've always thought. This is what we've always done. This is the way we do it at church. This is the way my tradition, this is the way that I think, wait, 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 wait. That's not faith. Faith is knowing what this book says, being able to articulate what this book says, being able to identify these promises within their correct context, and saying, I trust God. Even when I don't totally see and understand, I trust God. Now, unit 3, verse 64, his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spoke and praised God, just as God promised. Now, here's the reaction of friends and neighbors and family. And fear, or awe, as we would say today, came on all that dwelt round about them, and all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And then the point of it all is what we read in verse 66, and all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, what manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. In other words, they all know that something huge has just happened. And when they say the hand of the Lord was with him, you need to understand this is not just a, a nice saying. In Hebrew culture, this was a Hebrew idiomatic expression to say the following, God has a very special plan for this child. That's when they would use that phrase that is very accurately translated in our Bibles, but it's just that many times we don't understand what it means. We, under, we see what it says, we just don't understand what it means unless we understand the context. Number one rule of Bible study. The hand of the Lord was with him. Now, verse 67 is a transition. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, and prophesied, saying. And now he's going to sing a song. Last week we saw Mary's song. Remember that? It's called the Magnificat. And you remember what I told you last week, we call it the Magnificat after all these years because for a thousand years the main Bible that was used in Christendom was the Latin Bible and the very first word in this song in Latin is Magnificat or Magnify and uh, so we, we just call it by that name. This is called the Benedictus and you say the Benny what? Benny who? Benedictus and that's the very first word of this song in Latin as well, blessed. And uh, so we're going to see what he sings and I want to tell you the same thing I told you last week about, about Mary. When we read the Bible, we often read it as though we were watching a television program or a movie. And that's not all bad, but sometimes it causes us to make assumptions that may not necessarily be true. And so I told you last week when Mary enters into the house of Elizabeth and Elizabeth greets her and, and uh, all of that, and, and then we have Mary's song, the Magnificat, it doesn't necessarily mean that Mary, as I told you last week, waltzed into the room and like Julie Andrews in Sound of Music just burst into song. That's not what the Bible says. She spent three months there. 
And at some point in that period of time, as she prays and reflects and meditates and ponders and guards these things in her heart, she is composing in her heart this song. Now, as I told you, she was probably illiterate, so she is not necessarily writing down this song. She is making this song in her heart. And by the time she is probably in her 70s, she's meeting with Dr. Luke and telling this story and singing to him this song that has been in her heart ever since that she's never forgotten. And so the song of Zacharias is of the same nature. It doesn't mean that this song just popped out of his mouth in the moment. It may have. We, that's not what the Bible says. At some point, as Zacharias gains back his ability to speak and begins to praise God, as he reflects on what he's learned, this song is the result. Maybe he composed this song in his heart during those months that he was mute and unable to speak. We don't know, but I just want you to understand that. Now, here's the other thing that I want you to think about. Here's two songs. One song written by a young teenager, Mary. The other song written by a grizzled old priest, Zacharias probably in his 70s. Two different generations, two different songs. We have no idea what either one of those songs sounded like. I bet they were a little different because for the last several thousand years of human history, usually the youthful generation have us a little different style musically than the older generations. Have you noticed that? It just kind of seems to work that way and always has. And we don't know what those songs sound like, but I can tell you this. If you would have heard either Mary or Zacharias sing these songs, it wouldn't sound at all like anything you've ever heard. And you would probably be a little uncomfortable at first because it would not sound like an old German or English hymn. It would sound nothing like that. But yet here we have them today without music, and we have the heart and the soul of what was communicated, and that's the point. We have three services on Sunday morning, and, and, and every one, the music is totally different, totally different. And everybody has a preference of music. That's, that's, that's natural. That's okay. That's not, that's not a problem. Everybody knows what they like and don't like. But just be careful that we don't judge another generation or another culture because their style is a little different than what we are used to when we can see the heart. In our first service this morning, we sang a hymn that was composed during the Welch Revival in 1905. And I made the comment afterwards. I don't think that when they sang it in Wales in 1905, they had an electronic keyboard and a trap set. We sang it a little differently than they would have 100 years ago, but yet the heart and the soul were still there. It's one of the blessings of being in a multi-generational, multi-ethnic church is the fact that we gain exposure to so many different people and backgrounds and experiences and preferences that enriches all of us if we embrace that. If you're a musician, you understand what I'm talking about because most people who are truly musicians like music, period. They like good music. Whether it's bluegrass or classical, they like jazz, they like R&B, they like music if it's good and if it has something to say. And the beautiful thing about the Bible, here we've got these songs here without music. And the cool thing is all through the centuries, composers have put both of these songs to music at different times, in different styles, in different ways, and the heart and soul remains to this very day. Just something to think about. When he writes this, he quotes the Old Testament at least 16 times. This is another one of those what we call chiastic parallel poems where the, the parallel ideas start at the outside and work inward to a core that is the main idea, the very heart of the song. So it's, you, you can never be wrong as knowing what the real message is because you see these parallel statements work inward, and when you get done visually, you have kind of the 
form of an X or the Greek letter chi that, that gives it chiastic. And uh, I'll put this on my web later on today if you'd like to see it in visual form. And we're going to throw up kind of an approximation of that on the screen as I work you through it. I, say, I, I think that another way to look at a chiastic structure is to think of a jelly roll. You know how a jelly roll has these rolls around it right to the very heart of it where the real good stuff is? And, and that's kind of how a chiastic song is. And let, let me demonstrate that. We're going to start in verse 68 where God visits his people and redeems them. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. To redeem is to make free by paying a price. Now, drop down to verse 78. Here's the parallel to that. Same thought. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And so there again, same thought. The day spring from on high, that's a poetic way to say the sunrise. In fact, sometimes in your Bible, that's just translated as east. Sometimes it's translated as day spring. Peter uses that in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. And it all goes back to the prophet Malachi in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2, where he looks forward to the coming of the Messiah and he compares it to the dawning of the sun of righteousness. And so Zechariah, being familiar with that passage of Scripture, he said, the day spring from on high, the, the, the new day of the Messiah has dawned. Salvation is here. And then in verse 69, God has given to us salvation, has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Now that phrase, that phrase horn of salvation, horn in the Bible does not always mean something you blow on. It is most of the time a symbol of power, as in a ram's horn, the sign of the power of God in his creation. So horn of salvation. God has shown his power in saving us. And then he talks about the house of David. And the word house is not used here in a literal sense, a literal habitation, but rather in the sense of family. This is the way that the Hebrews would have expressed it, in the house of his servant David. In other words, this Messiah is coming just as God promised. You can trust him. He's coming from the family of David. And so it was that Jesus is the descendant of King David. And then the parallel statement to that is in verse 77, again talking about the salvation that we have received to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Now back up to the top in verse 70, God's prophets prepared the way as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets which have been since the world began. Now what, what's he saying here? You can trust God. I should have trusted God. You can trust God. Everything that he said through his prophets has come to pass. It's been that way from the beginning. The coming of the Messiah is not a reactionary measure by God. It's the theme of history. And God has spoken about this down through the centuries. And then drop down to the parallel statement in verse 76. And thou, child, John, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. So what he's saying there is God's always spoken through his prophets, and you can trust him. And now, son, you are God's new prophet. You are going to be the one to prepare the ways of the Messiah. And again, that's quoting from Isaiah. It's quoting from Malachi. It is the promise that, that God had given to his people. And Zacharias is saying that you're going to be the fulfillment of that. And this is amazing because for over 400 years, there has been no prophet in Israel. Now, back to the top, verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Back down to verse 74 that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. God saves us from our enemies that we might serve him in righteousness. God set us apart. And then back up to verse 72. Now we're zeroing in on the purpose. We're coming to the very heart of the jelly roll. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers. 
Now drop down to verse 73, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. And that brings us to the very, very heart of the jelly roll, the last part of verse 72, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath. That's the point. And as you can see, everything that swirls around the center of the jelly roll is leading up to this very thing. You can trust God to do everything that he has said. You may not see it now. You may not understand it now. You may not see it in your lifetime. But you can trust God to do everything that he has ever said. That's the point. And then he comes in verse 80. We'll, we'll pick up verse 80. This is another transitional statement. And the child grew and waxed or became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. So the child is born and the child grows up and becomes strong. Now, we're going to see next week in chapter 2 the birth of Jesus. Now, as you might suspect, these are parallel in Luke's poetry. In fact, I'll put up on my blog at that time this in visual form that you can see that. But I want you to see the parallel to what we just read in verse 80. Drop down, if you would, in chapter 2 to verse 40. And this is speaking of Jesus. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Do you see how this is not just Luke sitting down and scribbling something off the cuff? There is amazing creativity and thought that goes into every word that you have here. And he's laying out these two births in parallel form. And the whole point that we're making today is simply this. You can trust God. You can trust him. And you know what? We probably ought to grow up too. That's the major point. Would you, would you look in 2 Peter chapter 1 for just a moment? Peter picks up on this very theme, 2 Peter chapter 1. Look in verse 3. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, some things, most things are all things. Thank you. <laughs> All things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue. Why is it that a lot of people don't understand that and realize that in their life? Because they don't really know him. So, so how do I apply this? Verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, what? These precious promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I'll tell you another indication of spiritual sickness. When you hear somebody say, I just need that hard preaching. Really? Why? I'm just such a scoundrel. I'm just, I know I'm a sinner. I just need that hard preaching to keep me in line. How about reading the Bible and growing up? How about learning how to overcome those internal lusts and be more like God and be conformed to his image? And because we as the church, I'm not speaking of this one or any other, I'm just speaking we, the church in general here in this country in these years, are not doing a very good job of getting people deep into the Word of God. We've got churches filled with people who don't know the Word and don't know much about the Lord. And so they come to church, hear the same salvation message over and over and over and over and over and over, and they want it hard and loud, even though they got saved 30 years ago, because they've never learned how to grow. They're still on Gerber's when they should be eating a normal diet. And they need to grow. They need to grow up. Our lives ought to parallel those of John and Jesus. There are over 8,000 promises of God in this book. Just about every situation in your life that you could think of and many that you can't are covered by those 8,000 plus promises. But if you don't know what they are, you're going to have a hard time trusting God. 
And if you have a hard time trusting God, you're not going to be able to trust others very well either. And if you can't trust God, you're not going to grow up and you're going to get stuck in a rut. John and Jesus had miraculous births. You say, well, that was John and Jesus. Read the Bible. You had a miraculous birth too if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You ever read what Jesus said when he said to the religious leader Nicodemus, you need to be born again? The very same Peter in 1 Peter said that we are born again by the word of God that endures forever. How are we born again? By working at it? No, but by believing the word of God that endures forever. You've had a miraculous birth if you are really a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you are not, and if you have not had a miraculous birth, that ought to be step one on your journey today. You need to talk to somebody about that. You need to avail yourself of the many opportunities to know him. And, and just as God specifically gave names to both John and Jesus, Revelation 2 and 3 says he has given us a new name as well. Interesting thought. Just as their lives were the fulfillment of Scripture, so ours should be too. A friend of mine used to say that the measure of success is when we live in accordance with what is written of us in the Word of God. But when you don't know what is written, you're not going to be very successful. God had a mission for them. He does for us. They needed to grow. We do too. Not to stay the same. They were filled with God's Spirit. So should we be. You remember we, we ended last week by pointing you back to Luke 1, verse 35, where Mary has just said to the angel who has told her this incredible news, and she said, well, how's that going to happen? I'm a virgin. And in verse 35, the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Not that God was going to have sex with Mary. That's blasphemous but rather that the Spirit of God would overcome her and work within her a supernatural miracle. Now, it is that same Greek phrase that the same author, Dr. Luke, uses in the second book that he wrote, the book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse 8, just as Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven, these are his last words to his followers in verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. That's exactly the same Greek phrase that the angel said to Mary. You beginning to see the parallels here? This is God's promise. Is that your reality? And if it's not your reality, I just want to encourage you, figure that out. There's so many people that come to church week after week after week, churches all across this city, all across this country, and their lives are a mess. Their relationships are a disaster. Their marriages fall apart. They have no friends. They're lonely. They're desperately lonely and reaching out for people. They, 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 they've learned they can't trust anybody. And very few of them connect the dots and realize, maybe I can't trust anybody because I've never learned how to trust God. And you can't learn how to trust God if you don't know what he said. And you can't know what he said if you don't put forth some effort to learn this book. I can't do that for you in just an hour every Sunday morning. It's a good place to begin. But in this place, there is an obscene abundance of opportunities to learn the Bible. All you've got to do is decide you want it. Sometimes I have people say, well, I, you know, I looked at the website, I could, and, and I appreciate that. We, we, we try to do the best job we can at communicating, but, but hear my heart for just a second. You don't need an announcement. You don't need a bulletin. You don't need a website, and you don't need a guide to find that stuff in this place if you want it badly enough. I'm just telling you, it's there. But if it doesn't mean enough to you to come and get it, I can't fix that 
for you. I can only fix that for me. I'm sorry, but I can't. But I can tell you this, you can trust God.